So to conclude our Explorers session, we have two more speakers. The first is Andreas Keller, a research associate at Rockefeller University. Andreas has been running one of the most hands-on labs here, uh, profiling olfactory responses right here at the GET conference. So I know a lot of you have already uh, visited him. The ability to publicly share these olfactory responses coupled with public genetic data makes PGP participants an ideal group for creating public data for understanding human smell. And I'll leave it to Andreas. Thank you for the nice, thank you. And for all of you who stuck around to to listen to me and special thanks to everybody who came downstairs and did the testing. You did us a great favor by helping us out with that. So I'm gonna dive right in, talk about smell. How does smell work? I have a little video for that. So odors are little molecules flying through the air. Back to the video, sorry about that. Odors, little molecules flying through the air. They have different shapes and structures. And then in your nose, you have sensory neurons. These are the sensory neurons in your nose. Each of those has one out of hundreds of different receptors on the surface. And depending on what receptor they have, they bind to different odors. So each receptor binds to a different set of odors. Each odor activates a different set of receptors. And what you get as an end effect of this is a combinatorial code, each odor has a unique combination of receptors that get activated. That signal gets sent into the brain, into this structure called olfactory bulb, where you have these glomeruli. Each glomerulus gets input from all the cells that express the same receptor. So you get a code, a combination of those glomeruli being activated by each of those receptors. And so the reason why I'm interested in that is because, can't figure out this thing. The reason why I'm interested in that is because these receptors are not only the largest gene family in the human genome, they are also extremely variable. So you have extremely genetically, extremely variable receptors. And so I'm just putting up, you don't need to read that, I'm just putting up that um, paper from 2003 as a historical reference. They were kind of the first who drew attention to this phenomenon, but since then, dozens of studies came out showing how genetically variable they are. So you find everything, you find duplications, deletions, you find fusions between two receptors, and of course, you find many, many, many point mutations. And many of those point mutations actually lead towards a non-functional gene, which is then called a pseudogene. So the way people think about that is in terms of something called genomic drift. The idea is that odor and receptor genes are free to duplicate. Then you have two versions. One does the job, and the other one is free to mutate, try out new things. Usually they mutate into rubbish and then get deleted, turn into the pseudogenes, but sometimes they may accidentally mutate into something that binds a new interesting odor relevant for the organism, and that's how you multiply the number of those genes in the genome. So this happens not only in humans, this happens in all animals that have a nose. Um, the consequence of this, obviously, is that everybody in this room smells the olfactory environment with a different set of receptors. And therefore, one would assume it smells different to all of us. So this is the other side of the equation. So on the one side, you have huge genetic variability in the receptors. And on the other side, we know and knew for a long time that there's huge perceptual variability. One of the most interesting phenomena of perceptual variability is specific anosmia. So specific anosmia is a condition where you have people who have a normal sense of smell, but they kind of have a blind spot in it. 
So they can't smell, say, musky odors. They have an okay sense of smell, but they are very insensitive for musks. And many, many of these specific anosmias have been discovered in labs over the last decades or the last century almost. And probably the one most familiar is the one to asparagus urine odor. So, you're welcome. Um, so, asparagus urine odor, you probably know if you ask 10 people, does your pee smell different after you eat asparagus? Eight will say yes, and two will say, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and people thought for a long time that this is a variability in metabolism. Some people produce a smelly substance, others don't. But then, sometime in the 80s, people had the genius idea of making people smell each other's asparagus urine. <laughs> and so then they found out that this is actually variability in perception. So everybody produces the smelly compound, but just a certain percentage of people incapable of smelling that. So that showed that asparagus urine detection polymorphism is a specific anosmia. And as I said, there are many, many others like that. Okay, so you have these two things. You have genetic variability in the receptors. You have perceptual variability, including specific anosmias that are specific for groups of odors. So the obvious hypothesis is that those two things are causally related, that the variability in the receptors causes specific anosmias. So we went ahead and tested that at Rockefeller, and we did phenotyping of many, many different subjects. And I have a short movie to show you how that works. So this is similar to what's happening downstairs right now, and many of you have done. So this is Peggy, who did all the data that I ever collected was collected by her. This is a subject, and the odors are in those tiny little bottles, and so the subjects smell them, and then the computer asks, for example, scan in the art odor from triplet 79. So in this case, there are three little bottles. Two are the same, one is different. We ask the subject to find the different one. That's how we find out if they can tell apart similar odors. Another test that some of you have done downstairs is the um, descriptors. So you can just have sliders and are asked how does the odor smell, and then you pull a descriptor to indicate how much it smells. And then the last one here is the most simple one. This is about if people can smell something. So the way this works is you have two bottles. One has a solvent, the other has the odor, and your task is to tell us which one has the odor in it. And you can then go down in the concentration and find the threshold of people. And you've probably seen the subject had a Band-Aid on the arm. That's how we get the DNA by um, taking blood sample there. And so at Rockefeller, we do all the phenotyping. So we needed somebody to collaborate with to do the genotyping. And that was Hiro Matsunami and his lab at Duke University. Two people who worked with Hiro Joel Mainland and Hani Swang have now moved on and have their own labs, and we still collaborate with them. So they do the genotyping, but they also have, um, as probably the only lab in the world that can do that, a method of finding ligands for receptors in cell culture. So they express the receptor in a cell culture and then have a way to find out what odor activates them. So that allows us to verify the mechanism that we believe is between the genotype-phenotype correlation. All right, so then the, um, the result of those correlations is that, yes, indeed, the hypothesis is right. Specific anosmias, at least some of them, are caused by genetic variability in receptors. So what's shown here, this is from a paper in 2007. This was the first case. So we show two genotypes. One has two functional versions of an odorant receptor, and the other has only one functional version of the same odorant receptor. And then what's compared is how strong that odor smells to subjects. And you have 60 different odors plotted here. The details aren't important, but what's important is that of those odors, only those two have a big difference, and the difference is that people 
who have only one functional version are less sensitive to that odor. If people only have, and people have no functional version, they're even less sensitive, but the N is so small that it's difficult to say something about that. So that's an, <clears throat> an exciting result. It's been replicated since then in three other labs. We replicated it ourselves, so it is true. And what happened, this was 2007, right? So sequencing was slow and expensive and all that. So we went in and went odor and receptor after odor and receptor. Luckily, I wrote the consent form vague enough. It just said we sequence some genes that may have something to do with smell that after it became expensive and quick, we could go back to the same DNA and sequence 400 odor and receptor in those people. So what we have is a matrix of 60 odors and how they are perceived and 400 genotypes at those 400 human genes. And so what I could do is go for the next 10 minutes through many more of those slides that look exactly like that, only that the receptor is a different one and the odors are a different one. We have that and we're gonna publish that hopefully very soon. So I'm not gonna do that, just telling you we found many more cases of that. Um, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna talk a little more about these two odors here, antrostadienone and antrostenone. You can see from how similar the names are that those are similar odors, so that gives you additional confidence that this is true, that those very similar odors show independent effects. But what are these odors? So this is the structure of antrostadienone, and if you are a physiologist, then you recognize that it's very similar to testosterone, and that is because it's a degradation product of testosterone. And what happens is that people sweat out testosterone, and then it gets broken down into this smelly compound by bacteria on the skin. And because men have more testosterone than women, it's a man smell. So men have much more antrostadienone in their sweat and in other bodily fluids than women have. In addition, the same odor is a strong sex pheromone in many, many animals, most noticeably in pigs where it's very well studied. So the female pig has to go into a mating stance for mating to occur, and that is induced by antrostadienone. So if you're a pig farmer, you can buy that odor in a can and you spray it on your pigs when you wanna do artificial insemination. And so these two facts, the fact that this is like a man smell, that male sweat has so much more of it, and that it's a pheromone in so many animals, led to all kinds of speculations, and when you Google human pheromone or you know, I wanna attract women or something like that. You get all kinds of links to websites where you can buy that stuff and that's almost always androstadienone or similar components. I can get it much, much cheaper for you, um, <laughs> obviously, but the cheapest is probably not to buy it because it probably won't have a pretty big effect. But officially, I have no opinion. I don't care if this is a pheromone or not. But how this helps us is that because of these connections, many, many people have studied the effects of that odor on physiological and psychological and behavioral measures. So we have a lot of interesting and solid data that hints in that direction for exactly this odor where we know a receptor. So the one thing I'm gonna um, focus on is the cortisol level. So this paper by Noam Sobel's lab, smelling a single component of male sweat alters level of cortisol in women. That single component of male sweat is antrostadienone. So if women smell antrostadienone, there are changes in their cortisol level. They don't happen with control odors. So we asked ourselves, we have the receptor and the variability and we know it affects the conscious perception, the detection limit and the intensity perception of that odor. Does that also affect those physiological responses? So we did another study. Um, I have another video for that. We, this study was only done in women and only when they were ovulating. So I gave them home ovulation tests and they called me saying I'm ovulating and then we brought them in, Peggy brought them in and tested them. 
And so I have a video for that too. So this shows, um, this is a subject and me, and so she fills out a survey before, and this is the important part. She gives a saliva sample, which is where we get the cortisol from. I also measured skin conductance during odor exposure. And then she sits in a dark room for 40 minutes and sniffs those odors. The computer instructs her when to sniff and so on, and we control for the sniffing with this nice helmet. And so we had this measure, this cortisol level change measure for the odor. We replicated that paper that indeed androstadienone has an odor-specific effect on it. And then we looked for this receptor I showed you earlier that influences intensity perception, and it didn't influence the cortisol um, production at all. But then we found another receptor that also binds to that odor, and that other receptor correlated with the cortisol perception. So that's a pretty big result because it has two receptors that independently of each other mediate the reportable perception of the odor and the physiological um, responses to it. So this mimics what you find in many animals where you have a vomeronasal organ and a normal olfactory organ that are supposed to be specialized for those things. And that's it. I have to thank my boss, Leslie Fossall, who is a great boss and very, very supportive of all that. And of course, again, Peggy, who's doing all the work, and the nice people from society and science give me money to do all that. So if there are any questions, I'm ready for questions. Hi, that was a very interesting talk. Yeah, um, so I was wondering, um, in school curriculums, it's very often we, we use this test of bitter tasting component, com compound and sh show hands who can taste it, who can't, and you talk about some genetics. Is there any um, part of your research that could be easily and readily um, uh, adapted for a school curriculum uh, to discuss uh, olfactory genetics instead of taste? Yes, absolutely. So antrostadienone is probably the best odor for that. So the reason why we studied it is not that we were interested in this whole sex pheromone theory, but because for that odor, 10% of the population can't smell it. Some populations even more, 20 or 30. So that's much higher than for most other odors where you have 1% or 2%. So if you have this odor and you give it to a classroom, you're certain to have people who can smell it and people who can't smell it. And then they can discover that and discuss that. I bring that to demonstration when I talk in smaller groups, I pass it around too. And that odor can be easily bought it's not very cheap, but it can be easily bought at Sigma, and then you just put it in those small bottles. So just send me an email. Um, I've, I, I talked to other people about that who did that in the classroom. Yeah. I think it's a great, great classroom experiment. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the difference between men and women in smelling uh, odors, especially in smelling under study unknown. Yeah. Um, women are better at smelling, um, and it's a, pretty, it's a pretty big and solid difference across all types of odors and all types of tests that are being done. And that is also true for androstadienone. In the older literature, there was reports that it's even more extreme for androstadienone, so that women would be highly specifically sensitive to that odor and men not didn't hold up in my own study. It doesn't hold up. There is a difference, but it's not dramatically different from the difference in other odors. Uh, sort of a technical question, bringing this back to genomics. Um, you know, sadly, unfortunately, olfactory receptors tend to be some of the hardest genes in the genome to actually accurately variant call because of read mapping ambiguity and stuff like that. Yeah. Have, have you, how would you use data sets like the PGP or what, what can we do to help make the data better to look at genetics and olfaction? Yeah. Yeah. 
you're right, it is difficult, difficult receptors because they are highly similar and often it's not possible to distinguish variants from duplications and these kinds of things. So any kind of increase in the data will help us, but specifically what the PGP would be interesting for interesting for us is because of the variable region and expression level variability because everything I talked about is a coding region variability. So you have different looking receptors, but we know from, from expression studies that there's huge variability in the expression. Many people just don't make odorant receptors that other individuals make. And so that's where we could come in. This, what I'm talking about, explains only little of the variability if we could add the regulatory regions, we could explain potentially much more.